Welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton. And we're here at the Oz ACPDM conference in Cairns, Australia, to interview world leading researchers, clinicians, and people with lived experience to support your practice in being more evidence based. Welcome back to Oz ACPDM. We are joined now by the wonderful Marissa Smith, who is a physiotherapist at and clinical coordinator, sorry, physiotherapist <laughs> and clinical coordinator at the Healthy Strides Foundation. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Ash and Dana. Hello. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's nice to have you on the other side of this. I know. Yes. you. <laughs> some people may recognize Marissa's voice mm-hmm. as co-host of the podcast. Yeah. And so yep. this is a different side today, being the person yeah. who's getting asked the questions on the other side yeah are there any impersonations coming up this time not today no they are they they've gone (laughs) (laughs) i am disappointed to hear that (laughs) i've never i've never been in the room where they're not occurring on air again (laughs) we'll see about that we can try i think we can try yeah it brightens challenge accepted yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) but we're not here to talk about impersonations no no, no, No. that's right they might come out later but we are here to talk about your paper marissa functional mobility matters embedding motor learning interventions using dynamic robotic technology. And I've had a look at the abstract and I'm pretty excited about this one. I love this. The more times (laughs) I read through it and in preparing the presentation, it makes me excited. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I love that. Well, talk us through a bit about why you did this work. Like Mm. why, why is this work important? What gap were you trying to fill here? The gap was, well, as clinicians, Mm. we're all common goal is around functional mobility, Mm -hmm. around improving independence across different contexts for children. Mm -hmm. And particularly for children around that GMFCS two to three level Mm -hmm. where they would have independence maybe with a walker or in their wheelchair. But Mm. there's some environments that are quite complex, like busy classrooms or bathrooms. And if we could just, if we think they have the potential, if we could get them to mobilise, for example, with crutches or with a bit less support, Mm -hmm. it would greatly increase their freedom and independence. Yeah. And so the reason behind all of yeah. this is we were, were fortunate to have the piece of equipment, the Zero G, mm-hmm. which I can go into more if, if you like at some point, but mm-hmm. um, is how we can challenge children. We can challenge them safely, yes. mm-hmm. aligning with all the things we know work best for therapy, all mm-hmm. those green light interventions. Yep. Mm-hmm. Challenge them safely to be able to develop their functional mobility skills. Did you know what? Just push that bar, their potential, yeah. and so maybe go from using a walker to crutches yeah. and the freedom that that allows. Yep. So. Yep. Really, as therapists, put in the forefront of our mind what children have to do on a day-to-day basis. Yes. How can we push them to really maximise that potential? Yeah. 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 And how do we as therapists train that safely? Yeah. Mm. You've summarised that beautifully. That was really nice. And I would have yeah. to say what came to mind, like I can literally see it in my head, is the ICF right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we, you're talking about how we can maximise their activity and participation mm. so we can they can be as independent mm-hmm. as possible. Yeah. The part that you're really tapping into here is those little bubbles at the bottom that we yeah. often have there, but mm, what do we do about it, <laughs> mm-hmm. is the environmental yes. yeah. factors and yeah. the personal factors. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about a group of kids here who have that mobility, but they need that a little bit more because they want to be a bit more independent. Yeah. And you're thinking about the environmental aspects here, aren't you? Absolutely. It's yeah. things like, you know, we obviously in clinical spaces have space and, you know, there's not clutter, but, you know, stand at home toys mm. everywhere or really Lego narrow. Pieces. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bits everywhere. Yeah. Really narrow hallways, small bathrooms. Yeah. You know, yep. You've got to negotiate around and, yep. and it's particularly just being able to challenge children. And mm. often as therapists, sometimes mm. because of safety, we we can't and we yeah. don't want to, but yeah. that's something that Zero G really allows is allows us to safely challenge children yeah. and to be able to make those improvements. Yeah. yeah, And we'll touch on the Zero G and what an amazing piece of equipment that is in a second. But before we do, can you just summarise really quickly for the listeners what your what your research question was given all that beautiful context you've just provided? It was could using robotic technology improve functional mobility? Yeah. And using a single case design. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. We love a single case design. <laughs> I've learned a lot as well about yeah, single case designs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell us about your single case design. Who yeah. was involved? How long did it go for? So our single case design is based on a seven-year-old boy with cerebral palsy. Mm-hmm. He's classified within GMFCS level three. Mm-hmm. And his FMS pre was 221. Mm-hmm. So this child, who we did the single case design on, attended two programs Mm -hmm. over a nine-month period. The first program at the very start was six weeks long, Mm -hmm. was made up of three two-hour sessions a week. Mm -hmm. 
Then there was a break of around seven months. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the nine-month period, he attended another four-week program. Yep. Again, three sessions a week for two weeks. Okay. It's important to note that he had no other intervention during that time. Okay. Mm-hmm. And in the two-hour sessions, the majority of the first hour was spent in the zero-G with the second part being out of the zero-G. Okay. Now, talk to us oh, about the zero-G. Yes. Oh, look. <laughs> I love this piece of equipment. Absolutely amazing. So yep. zero-G we describe as the like, kind of like the missing link. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a dynamic body weight support um, system where the child wears a harness mm-hmm. and then they're tracked up um, to the zero-G, which yep. is an overhead tracking system as well. But th- what's so amazing about the zero-G is it provides dynamic body weight support. And being dynamic means it can be incremented, it can change. Yeah. As the child develops, you can reduce that body weight support. Mm, right. So it allows for those incremental challenges. Yeah. Yeah. But also you can set a falls control to catch the child and yeah. mean that you can be hands-off as a therapist. Yeah. You can teach the child the mechanics of how to move, whether mm. it's with elbow crutches or to transfer on and off the floor or yes. you know, a variety yeah. of gross motor skills yeah. with your hands off. Mm. And you know that if they lose their balance, they're going to be safe. Mm. So it's otherwise, without the zero G, your hands are either on or they're off. Yeah. And it's kind of what makes us nervous as times as therapists to challenge children is that yeah. they're not safe. Yes. Yeah. Zero G allows you to do that. You can get a lot of repetition because they are yeah. safe. Such a game changer, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. We've seen it in action mm. and understanding, I suppose, what it's going to do from those active ingredients as green light yes. interventions. Because yes. it's, it's the hands-off part mm-hmm. that is the key. Like, you know, oh. there's no sports coach. We've spoken about this before. Yeah. Yeah. There's no sports coach that's going to, you play tennis. Yeah. Did someone hold your hand for the <laughs> No, you can't. You yeah. You can't, yeah. right? It's, yeah, it's all hands-off. Yeah. And yeah. So I think it's seeing yourself more as a coach. As mm-hmm. a therapist, you're a coach because you want that person to learn the motor skills, mm-hmm. have their own pathways and problem solve. I think yes. that's the part that, it's hard to do in therapy sometimes because you want to see them succeed, mm. but error is equally as important. Yeah, right. And and what that reminds me of mm. is the um, the co op approach that we yes. talk about sometimes. Yep. Um, cognitive orientation and getting kids to develop strategies themselves yes. to overcome problems or achieve goals mm. that uh-huh. they might have. Yeah, is very powerful yeah yeah and the the carryover effect they see goes much long term so Mm. you're not constantly relying on therapy to do your tune-ups you actually you're empowering the person Mm. to be in control of their body and to understand how it reacts and I I think of that research that was put out when we talked to Andrina Sabe and Mm -hmm. Heather Feldner yes and they were talking about toddlers and how they fall like over a hundred times in in a very short period Mm. of time and it's it's acceptable we we know it needs to happen yes but if our children don't learn how to fall safely, once they're a little bit bigger as well, mm. they're going to become fearful and yeah. not have their strategies. Yeah. yeah. And that's the good thing about the zero G is mm. they can fail or fall as such and they're mm. safe. They're not going to get an injury that then makes them stop. They get up, they yeah. keep going. And it's yeah. that you get so much repetition and practice because yeah. they are safe. Yeah. Um, and then as they improve on a skill, you can reduce that dynamic body weight support yeah. as well. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And from and a safety perspective from a yeah. therapist, if you see a child falling, you know, you're not really meant to cash them if you're not going to, if you're going to hurt yourself because that's yeah. a big, mm-hmm. yeah. health, you know, a safety yep. risk. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And I think about the confidence that must give yeah. the child as mm. well to, mm. to be able to give things a go yeah. Yeah. in a really safe yeah. environment and not be anxious about falling that's or, right. yep. yeah, hurting yep. themselves. Yep. It, yeah. It must just be really freeing. Mm. And it shows them what they're capable of. So for mm. the child in the single case design, you know, using crutches at the start was was something obviously not familiar. Mm. Yeah. And so it's it's building up knowing, okay, I'm safe, I can give this a go. Yes. And then that fear element leaves and they can really focus on learning the movement and the skill rather yes. than being so nervous about it and nervous yeah. about falling. That's right. Um, yeah, so so many good things about it. Yeah. Can I quickly touch on I know we've spoken about single case experimental mm. design mm. skids. And this was done in one child, which is still really robust. Yeah. But why is a single case design more robust than what people often would think is a case study? Yeah. I think that's worth touching on. Yes. Yeah. So the single case design, it involves intensive, intensive data collection for that child over the intervention period. Mm. And it's made up of two distinct phases. So we've got the baseline phase and um, once a stable baseline is achieved, we can move into the intervention phase. Mm-hmm. And the reason it is so robust is that the – effect of the intervention is measured after every session Mm -hmm. and we use that 10 point scale based Mm -hmm. on the target behavior Mm -hmm. and so at the end of every session we're able to quantify where the child is progressing towards their goal Mm -hmm. this is all assessed by visual analysis 
Um, and then there's other statistical measures like the tell you and the, and the percentage of non-overlapping data that also adds, adds I guess, extra rigour yes. um, to the yeah. to what's behind the, the sked. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So, so, love it. I'm itching to know. <laughs> oh, yes, I love this. I get excited to reveal. Yeah. <laughs> what did you find? Oh, so many exciting things. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> uh, so clinical measures. So um, the child's GMFCS um, percentile for his age and GMFCS level went from the 40th to 60th percentile. Wow. In from the first program the first to the second program, yeah. So yep. when I'm talking now in pre and post, yep. pre is before both programs, yep. yes, and post is post the second program. So okay. nine, nine months oh. yep. period. So okay. at the end of that nine month yep. period. Yep. So when I, yeah, just yep. I should clarify that. Um, in terms of ten meter walk test, mm-hmm. there was clinical significant improvement in his mm-hmm. walking speed. Mm-hmm. Six minute walk test distance more than doubled wow. Wow. but what was most significant is that he went from needing 22 catches or you know, losses of balance yep. in his first baseline six minute walk test mm-hmm. to yes. no losses of balance wow at post which then translates to his fms improving yes, yes from a two two one yep. to a three three one Two, three, two. Oh, well, yes, he does use it. Yeah, yes. he kind of goes between. Yeah, so okay. one, his choice. Yeah. Longer distances. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, the big thing is that he was able to use elbow crutches in indoors mm-hmm. and short distances outdoors, where he was u- normally using a walker. Yeah. So for this child, I love this video we have of him at home, mm-hmm. and using his elbow crutches in his living room to get down his narrow hallway that he otherwise couldn't access <laughs> oh. into the bathroom. Yeah. Wow. And so that's a huge game changer. Yeah. Um, so if his functional mobility improved yep. and he was able to do that safely, yes. his parents felt safe with him doing that, yeah. his parent, which is amazing. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, that was a huge thing. Yeah. And really highlights what you were saying before about the environment mm. and, yeah, right. you know, coming yeah. back to the ICF, yeah. how, what that really looks like mm. in real life. Mm. It's, you know seems quite innocuous to some people but actually to that family that is it's huge a huge change huge. Yep. and yeah. very liberating for yeah. that child yeah. yeah yeah it gave him that freedom and, and confidence to do that and yeah. I think it translated to other um situations as well whether yeah. it was in the playground and in the classroom and even where he's at with his age being seven you know he's yeah. able to the fact that he can balance and have those writing re- those reactions yeah. and you know there's a lot more body weight going through your legs when you're using crutches than yeah. the, the walker in terms of less fixing through his upper limbs. Yeah. Just puts him in a really good position in terms of where he's at with his age and what, yeah, what he is true. capable of and, yeah. and also as he gets older. Yeah. yeah. This is maybe a tricky question because mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I want to I want to touch on, I suppose, the what clinicians can take away from this work because yeah. I think, you know, there's lots of really important takeaways. Yeah. But I also want to know kind of within that, what they can take away if perhaps they don't have access to a zero G, mm-hmm. you know, what are the things that you've learned in doing this study that you think are applicable to all clinicians, whether they have access to a zero yeah. G or not? I think it's looking at, you know, we always look at the child and thinking about what environments they access on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. and what equipment may help them yeah. access those environments with more freedom. And particularly those that are GBFCS3 that at times we're like, can we, you know, reduce their supports on their walker? Could we mm. progress them to elbow crutches? And if you think they can safely, then it's working a way of, of being able to train for that. You know, that's what we are as, as physiotherapists. We're there yeah. to train to yeah. obviously have those improvements. And then looking at our dosage around therapy and looking at all those green light interventions, mm. um, those active ingredients yeah. in terms of how we're then dosing our therapy yeah, and what we're yeah. doing, the hands-off approach. Yeah. How do we do it safely? I feel like it reinforces yeah. the hands off approach. Mm. Well, it reinforces the active ingredients. Mm. So, yes, yeah. you might not have a zero G, but it almost reinforces beautifully by saying, actually, if you are hands off, you can allow them to yeah. practice as much as you can. Yeah. You can make it as safe as you possibly can. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I don't know about you. I go to lots of um, health conventions or conferences, and people have got so much robotic equipment around. Mm. It's the new thing, right? Mm-hmm. Finding the right technology. And I think it's. I don't know from my perspective, I would try to find the right kind of equipment mm. that actually matches the active ingredients. Abs- yes. Absolutely. Because you don't want something where the child is being passive. Yes. If their goal is to learn that skill. Yes. You know, if it's for some other reason, then that's yes. but at the end of the day, we know to improve a, a gross motor skill, you need that active you need to do it. ingredients and the, yeah. act, the child being active. So yeah. yeah. Um the zero G is that kind of perfect technology to mm. fit with all those green light interventions. How exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. And I think one thing, just to quickly wrap up on that mm. that point that you made, mm. was 
uh, there was a phase where a lot of people were looking into the locomat, for example, mm-hmm, yes. for kids with cerebral palsy. They've done a lot of studies in it. And what they really came out to say, and Diane Damiana said, it mm. was it just did too much for them. Yeah. yeah. And so it looked really great for a piece of technology because these are all expensive pieces of equipment. Yeah. But it did too much and they didn't get the right outcome. Mm. So it's finding when you're looking for a piece of equipment, it's aligning it with those active ingredients. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Whose brain's doing the work. Whose brain's doing the work. Because at the nice end of the day, obviously, yeah. it translates to when they're out of yeah. the equipment. That's when it really yeah. matters. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter how they look necessarily. Well, obviously, you want them to be comfortable in yeah, the equipment. Of course. But yeah. it's not about their alignment in equipment. It's yeah. about them. What happens when they're out of it. That's so cool. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for coming on, Marissa. Thanks for having Enjoy me. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Will yes. do. <laughs> and everyone else, stay tuned for more research so works more. at AUSACPDM. <laughs> Talk to you again soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.